Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. Yet again, he does that a lot, right? And what I think is really interesting this morning is that we're getting two different versions of the kingdom of God in our different readings today. But I do have to admit I'm cheating a little bit because I'm also remembering our reading from 1 Samuel last week because it kind of flows into the reading from 1 Samuel this week. And it's okay if you don't remember it. So story, actually even the backstory to last week's reading. So for centuries, the people of Israel had been governed by judges, right? This was really different from any other nation during that time in history. They were all governed by kings or you know, monarchs of some kind. And the people of Israel saw God as their king. The laws that God had given them in the Torah were the way that they lived together. And when there were differences of opinion about you know, how to interpret the law in any situation, that's when the judges came and they would settle those differences. But of course, that only works if people are mostly willing and able to obey the laws and if the judges are good and godly people who listen for God's voice as they do their judging. And as you might imagine, as time went by, there came some corrupt judges uh, who didn't listen for God's voice. They had their own interests foremost instead of the interests of the people and the interests of upholding God's law. And another thing that happened around the same time <clears throat> is that the nations around the people of Israel began to become threatening in a military way, right? So it started to look more and more as though the people of Israel were going to need to defend themselves against invaders. So there they are with corrupt judges and the fear of a military attack. And they decided that what they needed was to have a king like everyone else, right? A king would be able to lead them into battle. A king wouldn't corrupt the law for his own gain. Well, that's what they thought, right? Whatever, I don't know why they would think that. But anyway, so they asked Samuel to appoint a king to govern them. And Samuel wasn't happy about that. And we heard about this one last week, right? Samuel goes, has a conversation with God and God says, yeah, go ahead and appoint a king for them. And in that conversation, God pointed out, the people are rejecting God from being their king. And that they had done that many times. They had often rejected God and gone off to worship other gods. So Samuel goes back and tells the people of Israel in no uncertain terms exactly what it will mean to have a king. And you might remember this from last week. Basically, the king takes all the best stuff, your sons and daughters, your fields, vineyards, and orchards, your grain, your flocks, male and female slaves, all of it goes to support the king and the things that the king wants and needs. But the people still insist that they want a king to go and govern them and to go out and fight their battles for them. Okay, so God points out Saul to Samuel and Samuel anoints Saul as king, which is okay for a while and Saul wins a whole lot of battles and everybody's very happy. But then Saul starts to do what he thinks is best instead of what God has told him to do. So Saul is no longer being the king that God wants him to be, but instead he's making his own decisions and he's ignoring what God wants. And God tells Samuel that he regrets making Saul king. And after a bit, we get to what we heard in today's first reading. God tells Samuel to get some oil and go and anoint a new king, which of course turns out to be David. And, you know, we'll be reading quite a lot about David over the course of this summer. So I don't want to give away any spoilers, but eh, just assuming that you might have some remembrance of some of these stories, having heard them before, David does great things as a king and David also abuses his power as king. So 
that's what happens. And actually that's the point. It turns out that human kings eventually wind up being less than they should be. It's what happens. They become less godly, less generous, less focused on the people they're ruling. Being a king seems to create a predisposition to becoming self-centered. And as we saw in Saul's case, even idolatrous, right? Saul holding his own ideas about what to do as better than God's ideas. But let's go back to why the people wanted a king in the first place. They were having a problem with corrupt judges was one reason. And they thought that having a king would fix that. And let's just say it was pretty easy to predict that that wouldn't work out the way they wanted it to, because why wouldn't a king become corrupt? But we'll just leave that one aside, okay? And then the other reason was they wanted someone to fight their battles for them. And so I wanna tell you something. It looks to me like in asking for a king, the people of Israel were essentially abdicating their own responsibilities that God had given them. I mean, we the, just look at the situation, right? It would be hard to have a system of governance that relied on the commandments of the Torah and the judges to resolve the disputes that might come up. I mean, that would be hard. It would take a lot of work and personal responsibility. And even then it would still be hard. And it would be hard to raise an army with that kind of governance system as well. How do you do that? It's always much easier to do things when there is one person at the top who just makes all the decisions and tells everyone else what to do. And then all of them do it. But that isn't the way that God set this up. And God must have had some reasons for creating the system of laws and judges rather than of a king. And I also just wanna note a side note here real quick, that of course, when the people insist on having a king, which wasn't God's choice for them, it's not like God just like takes off and abandons them. God does God's best to meet the people where they are and to choose a good king and to work with that king. And then when that king fails, God chooses a new king and so on because God is always faithful, even when we are not. And I also wanna say that I think that the way that the people of Israel behaved in wanting to give up their responsibility and essentially not work as hard by having a king and you know, not having to do all that thinking, it's very natural. It's very natural. And I think it's actually a model of how we often behave ourselves in our own life and our own situations. I mean, it's a lot of work to be really involved in how things get decided and how things get done. It would be a lot quicker and less effort for everybody involved if there was just a leader who makes the decisions and then everyone else goes along with it. Now, of course, it might not be the decision that you want, right? And that's a lot of what Samuel was warning the people about when he talked about uh, what would happen if they wanted a king. But without the responsibility for making a decision, the people are free to just go along with it even if they aren't wild about it or, you know, like giving up their sons and daughters and flocks and herds and grains and all that stuff. And the thing is, I think this happens a lot in the various areas of our own life right now. I think that lots of time we give up our own authority to a leader to handle things. And then we either go along with whatever the leader says or else we complain about the leader. And then after a while, the leader changes and there's a new leader and maybe we can go along with that one or else we'll complain about that one. It just kind of keeps going. And our modern lives are so complicated 
There are so many moving parts and so many different institutions and organizations and businesses that we all interact with. Of course, we can't be intimately involved with all of them, right? Which leads to the question, where do we need to be involved? Where do we really need to fight against our own inherited patterns of kingship or, or modified kingship, right? Like a leader who we give authority to and then either go along with and, or complain about. Where do we need to take our place and our responsibility for upholding what is right? In what areas of our own modern life would God want us to pattern ourselves more like the early people of Israel than like people with human kings. And here, this is where we get to look at the gospel for today because Jesus was talking to his disciples in a context in which the system of human kings ruling others and doing things for their own benefit rather than for the benefit of the people was absolutely established. No question, it was the way everything was. There were the rulers and there were the ruled. And Jesus was absolutely at the bottom of the heap of the ruled. And that of course is why so many people at the time thought that Jesus was going to rise up and lead a revolution and overthrow the rulers, which at that time would have been Rome along with the complicit leaders who enforced Rome, Roman authority, right? to overthrow them and then establish himself as the new king. It was the pattern that they understood. It was the pattern they expected because that's what they saw everywhere. But that was not what Jesus was about. Instead, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God again, a different kind of kingdom than the early Israelites had when God was their king. In this kingdom of God, temporal rulers have no place. In this kingdom of God, the images are not power and might and majesty. The images are ubiquitousness, growth, abundance. The kingdom of God can be found everywhere, not just in palaces and courts. The kingdom of God grows by itself in ways that are mysterious to us, like seeds that sprout and grow. The kingdom of God is the definition of abundance with grain sprouting and ready to be harvested with a tree grown from a tiny seed that becomes so enormous that it provides shelter and homes for the birds of the air. We, you and I, we are part of the kingdom of God. That kingdom, which is everywhere, it, which is full of growth, full of abundance, that's our true home. And because it is God's kingdom, we are invited, like those early people of Israel, to take our place in partnership alongside of God. God invites us to accept that responsibility and be co-creators of God's kingdom in every area of our lives. Are you ready? to commit or to recommit to being a co-creator alongside of God? Will you look for signs of God's growth and abundance in new and surprising places? Where have you already seen God's kingdom sprouting up in your life? In what ways 
have you already accepted God's invitation to being a co-creator? Where is God calling you next in that journey?